Today is, Mo Today is Monday, July 15th, 2013. We are at the Weston Gas Lamp Quarter Hotel in San Diego, California. We are here today to interview Judge Arthur Alarcon. Uh, in a brief video oral history, he records some reflections on his career in the law. My name is Brad Williams, and I'm here on behalf of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. This interview will be preserved in the NJCHS archives, okay. and the Historical Society will provide you, Your Honor, with a copy for your own use. I understand that you were born in Los Angeles. Yes. <clears throat> and you grew up in Boyle Heights, is that right? Uh, well, I, part of my uh, early childhood was in Boyle Heights, yes. My first uh, kindergarten was in Boyle Heights. And it was interesting because when I was interviewed by the LA Times after I got this job, uh, the reporter said, by the way, did you know that one of the other judges also went to the same grammar school you did? And I said, no, I didn't know that. It turns out that one of my colleagues also went to the same grammar school, although he was in first grade, I was in kindergarten. And who would that be? Yeah, I'm blocking on would, his... Would that be Harry Pragerson? Harry Pragerson, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> and by the way, now his son lives a half a block, so I'm tied into the Pragerson family. I guess so. I guess so. Um, where did you go to high school? I went to Fremont High School, which at that time was right near what they used to call Watts, but is now South Central Los Angeles. Right. And when you, um, when you graduated uh, Fremont, um, were you drafted? No, I enlisted. I enlisted uh, because in 1943, when I was a senior in high school, the uh, Defense Department uh, sent out a notice to high school seniors like me and said, if you want to uh, go to college on the Army, you can uh, take a test if you pass the test then you will enlist and we'll send you to two years of college. And when you graduate after two years of accelerated undergraduate work, you will then become a second lieutenant. So I thought that was a wonderful idea. So I took the test, I passed the test, and I was sworn in. And I went to Fort Benning, Georgia as a private. And I should have figured out something as I entered the gates of Fort Benning, Georgia, there's a big sign that says, the infantry school, follow me. Because 12 weeks later, when we finished our training, uh, I was assigned to go to Pomona College. And Pomona College was 20 miles from all the high school girls that I'd ever met. And all of my high school friends, male, were off in the military. So I thought, I'm going to have a wonderful two years with my little black book. We marched to the train station, and the general said, everybody have a seat, there's a problem. Five hours later, he stood up and announced, the specialized training program that all of you were involved in has been canceled. You are now transferred to the infantry. So I became an infantry soldier. and did not become a second lieutenant. <laughs> that could have been life-changing. <laughs> yes. So uh, at the end of the war, um, uh, you get out of the army. Yes. And um, what happened then? Well, I immediately enlisted or uh, signed up to go to UCLA. And at that time, things were less complicated than now. Because I, I was a straight A student in high school, at that time, the California Constitution said anybody in the upper 12% of your class uh, is entitled to go to the University of California. And so I applied to UCLA, and two weeks later, they sent me a notice saying, you're admitted. It was that easy then. My th things have changed, haven't they? <laughs> so you did a couple years at UCLA. Yes. And then what happened? Well, after I finished almost three years, I read in the paper that USC Law School uh, I had a program for a limited number of students who did not have an undergraduate degree. If they took the LSAT and passed it at a, at a high rate, 
And if they had a good grade point average in undergraduate, they would be admitted to USC, just a handful of us. And uh, at the end of the first year, if we passed the first year of law school, we would then be given an undergraduate degree and we would continue on in law school. So I took, took advantage of that. They accepted me. And at the end of the first year, I, I have a phony Bachelor of Arts degrees in pre-law, which was really my first year in law school. It's interesting because years later, the uh, lawyers in the country who had been in the military and, and been officers or were officers, when they enlisted, uh, they were uh, not given uh, the rating of captain as MDs were because they had gone to a graduate school and had a doctorate degree. So the lawyers got the, the uh, Defense Department and the law schools to agree that there would be a retroactive uh, JD degree given to all people who had graduated previous to that if we'd send in $25. Well, I thought it would be fun to continue to have my Bachelor of Laws degree, so I never sent the $25. So if you look at my resume, I'm not a JD. I'm one of the handful of Bachelor of Laws, perhaps, in the United States. Well, you had the best of both worlds, didn't you? You had, you had a UCLA education and a USC degree. And I went to uh, SC because the UCLA Law School was not open until the following year. At USC Law, are there any um, professors from your experience who stand out in your mind? Yes. Uh, one, of, one of my professors who taught a number of my courses, including property and domestic relations, was Robert Kingsley. And he later became dean. And he handed me my LLB. And I had the wonderful experience of a number of years later, when I was uh, 37, I was appointed to the California Court of Appeal. And I became a colleague of Robert Kingsley, who was then on the California Court of Appeal. Interesting. Um, at USC Law, did you have a study partner? Or did no. you study on your own? No, I studied on my own. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you graduate in 51. In 51. And um, uh, how soon after graduation did you attempt the bar? Well, I took the bar um, that summer and uh, got my results in January. And uh, I passed the bar. By the way, it was only 37% of the people that took the bar passed that bar, including only 60% plus from my law school. And I made the, the horrible mistake of deciding not to take a bar review course. So I studied on my own. And as soon as I talked to my friends who were taking the bar review course, and what a stupid mistake. I passed without taking the <laughs> refresher course, but I was lucky. Now it's just, it's, it's standard. People, yep. just about everybody takes the bar review course. Yep. Um, so you get out of law school, uh, you take the bar exam, and um, uh, what happens next? Well, uh, I became a law clerk for the appellate department of the Superior Court. And I worked for a wonderful judge, Edward Bishop, as his law clerk. And uh, I left that clerkship because I read an ad in the Daily Journal about a lawyer who was looking for someone with my training to go into personal injury work. And I thought, well, that's where the big bucks are made. So I went to work for him. And uh, I worked for him for two months. And then I discovered that some of his practice, I felt, were unethical. So I confronted him after being there two months. And he said, you're fired. So I went home. And I put on. Uh, uh, some wonderful classical music and this, read the snows of Kilimanjaro and an hour later and I had a wife who was pregnant an hour later the phone rang and the DA's office said by the way you took the DA's exam and you're number one on the list would you like to accept an appointment and I said yes I would indeed and he said well when can you start 
And I said, what time do you open tomorrow morning? <laughs> <laughs> so I was sworn in the next day. Uh huh. Well, that was fortuitous, wasn't it? Pardon me? That was fortuitous, wasn't it? Yes. As a deputy district attorney in Los Angeles County, what sorts of cases did you handle? Well, I had a wonderful DA who had the idea that he was going to change the way deputies were hired and assigned. And before he took office, his name was S. Ernest Roll. Uh, you were often in the DA's office three or four years before you got to try a felony case with other kinds of training before that. And he decided to handpick six people who had high grade point averages in law school and train them himself. And his idea was to put us handling felony cases in six months. So I was one of the six. And in six months, he put me handling felony cases. So I handle everything from death penalty, first degree murder, robbery, rape, and so forth after six months. Wow, that's quite an experience for a young, a young person right out of law yeah. school. Yeah, I was 26 years old. <clears throat> um, and you stayed at the, at the district attorney's office until about 1961, is that right? Uh, let me think now, yes. No, I was in the DA's office until about almost 63. Mm -hmm. uh, I then took a leave of absence for a year uh, to, because the governor uh, asked me to, to come to him and work as a director of a commission to study the narcotics program. So my boss gave me a leave of a year. Uh, I finished the work in nine months, so I went back to the DA's office. And three months later, the governor called me and he said, I'd like you to come to work on my staff as my legal affairs secretary. And I said, Governor, I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat. This was Pat Brown. Um, uh, I'm not opposed to capital punishment, you are. There are other views that you have that I don't agree with. You should have somebody who is loyal to your views, who would be sympathetic to whatever you requested, and give you best support possible for your views. And he said, I'm asking you to work for me because I trust your integrity and your judgment and your background. And I said, well, oh, and he said, furthermore, I said, what do you pay? And listen to this, 15,000 a year. And I said, governor, I make more than that now. And he said, it's impolite to turn the governor down on the phone. And I said, I can't afford to fly to Sacramento. He said, I will send you round trip tickets. So I flew to Sacramento. He interviewed me and he talked me into going to work for him. That's really interesting. How did you come to his notice? Do you know? How did I become How did you come to his notice? How did he become aware? Oh, how did he become aware um, of you? I came to his notice because when I was a deputy DA, that wonderful old man, S. Ernest Roll, who hired me, after I'd been in the office about six months, he asked me to come in. And he said, because of your law review background and your law clerk background, I want you to write a report for me on who is the chief law enforcement officer of Los Angeles County. He said, I'm having a dispute with the police chief and the sheriff. And of course, I know who the chief law enforcement officer is of Los Angeles County, but I want you to write a report. Patted me on the back and he said, do it as quickly as you can. Well, I spent over two weeks, and I could find nothing under California law that indicated who it was. So I did a, a search of the whole country, and I found a case out of Missouri where the police chief was permitting a bar, and this is in the 1920 when that decision covered, where they had totally nude dancers back in 1920. The sheriff, whose office was across the street from the police chief, sat there and did nothing because he was a sheriff of the unincorporated part of that city. So a citizen filed a lawsuit against the sheriff, and it's called under a common law warrant a quo warranto proceeding, which is by what right do you serve when you're not following the law? And sure enough, the sheriff was kicked out of office. And the Supreme Court of that state said the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer 
of a county and must move in and take charge of law enforcement when the local officials do not follow the law. So I finished the report and I called the, my boss's secretary and he said, come in right now. So I walked into the office and he had his chief deputy and his two secretaries standing behind his desk and he seated me in a huge chair that I couldn't move. And he got behind, behind me and he said, Arthur, tell us who the chief law enforcement officer is of Los Angeles County. And I said, sir, it's the sheriff. I then felt a heavy hand on my shoulder. He was quite a big man. And I thought, he's either gonna kill me or fire me. And he said to me, you really have guts. I'm going to appoint you as my assistant. You're going to write my speeches and you're going to handle special cases. As a result of that, he also asked me to write a, book, a research project on the exclusionary rule, the search and seizure rule, which I did. And to get to the answer to your question, he was invited to speak to the 58 uh, district attorneys in Los Angeles County because he had come out in support of the search and seizure decision. He was the only DA to do that. And he based it on my report. So he came into my office and said, you're going to go with me and I'm going to introduce you. You're going to give uh, your report and uh, educate these DAs. The governor was Pat, the governor was then attorney general of California. That's how I came to his attention. That is a great story. That's a fabulous story. Really interesting. Yeah. So it was a couple of years later when he put me on that special assignment. And then I, after that, he called me and appointed me to work for him. Was Cecil Poole working for Governor Brown at Cecil the time? Cecil Poole was working for him. He was the legal affairs secretary. I replaced Cecil Poole as the legal affairs secretary, yeah. Interesting. And Cecil, of course, came on the Ninth Circuit before I did, and he was my colleague when I joined. Yeah. Interesting. Funny how these things work out. Um, how long did you stay with Governor Brown? I was with him for three years, and near the end of the three years, he called me in, and he said, I'm having a terrible problem with the media uh, and law enforcement because of the, rec the recidivism rate. The return to prison after violation of parole is over 70 percent in California and I'm being pilloried with terrible editorials. So I'd like you to be the chairman of the parole board and go in there and straighten out the mess that they're in. And he looked at me and I looked a little crestfallen and he said, you've never asked me that, about your ambitions to be a, a judge, but I know you want to be a judge, and I'm going to make you a promise. The first Superior Court opening that comes up, you'll get it. So I went to work for the Pearl Board with that statement by the governor, and I, I brought in about 12 outstanding parole agents, and we wrote a procedures manual for the adult authority, the parole board, and they didn't have a written procedures manual. And uh, I turned it in to the, uh, the governor. He accepted it. 90 days after he made the promise to me, there was an opening. So he called me and he said, okay, I'm gonna keep my promise. And he put me on a spirit court after 90 days. That was in July of 64. When did you decide, that, when, at one point did you decide you wanted to become a judge? Well, there's a funny story in connection with that. When I was about three years, three or four years old, I remember I was still in my crib. I was standing, talking to my father. And my father said, you know, what you ought to do is study hard and become a lawyer. Because if you become a lawyer, you can practice law you can go into politics, you can teach, you can become a businessman, or you can become a judge. And that sounded good to me, and so that, that was my goal from the crib. 
Really? To that's my inter appointments. That's interesting. So do you remember your first day on the Superior Court? Yes. I drove down overnight from Sacramento. I served my last day as chairman of the parole board. And I walked in to uh, the Superior Court uh, presiding judge and told him, I'm, I'm your new judge. He said, raise your hand. And he swore me in to the Superior Court. And I'd been up all night driving. And he said, you have to go to a, a criminal department. There's a jury waiting for you. And I said, uh, sir, I, I haven't had any sleep. He said, I'm sorry, but they're waiting for you. So my first day as a judge was to preside over a jury trial. My goodness. <laughs> what was the case? What, was it, what were the charges? I don't remember now. I, I was <laughs> you probably confused. Probably did. Had a wing in, a, in a daze. <laughs> in a daze. the jury and everything. Were there, were there any memorable cases uh, from, from your time as a trial judge on the Superior Court? Any what kind? Memorable? Oh. Things that stand well, out? Well, the, the most interesting case that, that uh, I had as a Superior Court judge, uh, uh, let me see now. I'll tell you why I'm having a hard problem. I've always hated interviews in the, the legal newspapers where the judge says, in the answer to the question, what's the most important case you ever tried? I've always thought, you know, it's not really the judge who's the important actor in a case. It's the lawyers who work their socks off on both sides. It's the juries that listen to the evidence. And the judge just rules on evidence, and tries to be correct on the, the law and instruct the jury properly. So it's very hard for me to come up with what is the most important case. They're all important. Let me rephrase it. What's, what would be the most memorable experience that you had as a Superior Court judge? As a, as a Superior Court judge? I guess, um, and let me, I have to think back now because I served for 14 years as a criminal court judge and a spirit court judge, and as I said, all the cases were important to me. Uh, you know, I really can't pick one up. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I, no, because I keep going back to my days as a prosecutor, where then I had cases that are really memorable, but as a prosecutor, where I was one of the actors in the case. I think the most interesting case that I had as a prosecutor uh, with a wonderful mentor, J. Miller Levy, who was a leading trial lawyer in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, I was invited to co-chair with him a case involving a man, L. Ewing Scott. L. Ewing Scott was charged with killing his wife, but they never had found the body. And so Miller Levy and I put on a case for three months and we got a conviction a first degree murder without a dead body. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the conviction was affirmed. That was the most fascinating case to me to be a part of. Interesting, that's interesting. Um, After being on the, the Superior Court for some 14 years, um, you were appointed to the California Court of Appeals. Yes, I was appointed to the California Court of Appeals by the Governor Jerry Brown, who was serving in his first uh, term of office as governor, who, by the way, was also a Democrat, as was his father, Pat Brown. And I served on the California Court of Appeal for a little over a year and then there was, under President Carter, he organized commissions throughout the United States to advise him as to whom he should appoint to the District Court and the Circuit Courts of Appeal. Uh, he appointed a commission for the Ninth Circuit. And uh, I did not, uh, well, and they, they put in the legal newspapers a little clipping that said, do you want to be a federal judge? Fill out this coupon if you've had more than 10 years experience. So I read that and laughed and did not send in the coupon because 
my goal at the time was hopefully to be on the California Supreme Court. A few months went by and I got a letter from the co-chairs of the uh, commission for the Ninth Circuit and they said, you and 14 other lawyers and judges have been invited to file an application because we, we have reviewed your background and we think you would be an addition to the court. So I called my, my lawyer and my best friend and I said, what do you think I should do? I've never even been in a federal court since I was sworn in the first day I took after the, I passed the bar. And he said, look, they're not appointing you, they're just asking you to apply. So I applied and uh, I was interviewed for an hour by the commission and then three months went by and I hadn't heard from them so I thought, well, I guess that's over. I went out to dinner and went back to the California Court of Appeal and the phone rang at 10 o'clock at night and I picked up the phone and uh, the voice said, is this Judge Alarcon? And I said, yes, it is. And she said, we're calling from the White House. Uh, and I said, it's one o'clock in the morning and you're calling? Is this a joke? She said, just a moment. The, the chair of, the co-chair of the commission said, Arthur, uh, I'm in the White House and I, the speaker phone is on and the White House staff is telling me that you are a Republican. And I said, yes, I, I'm a Republican and I've been one since I was at UCLA and I first sworn in because I was so concerned about the decisions of Congress, which at the time was, was controlled by Democrats from the South because they kept getting reelected because no Republicans could get elected in the South. And I thought their uh, treatment of civil rights matters was terrible. So that's why I became a Republican because I wanted to be a member of the party of Lincoln. And I paused because I hadn't been interrupted. And I said to the chair of the committee who I knew from before, I said, Sam, are you there? And he said to me, and I'll change one word, oh, shoot, I thought you were a Democrat. So I tell people I'm President Carter's oh, shoot appointment to the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> well, that helps balance it out a little bit, doesn't it? Um, the chairman of the committee, uh, the commission that, that reviewed nominees, um, who was that? It was Sam Williams. A prominent attorney in Los Angeles. Yes, yeah, very prominent one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, he and I had a very interesting experience. <clears throat> he was offered an appointment at the California Supreme Court, and he turned it down. And after I got on the Ninth Circuit, I'd been on a, just a handful of months, Governor Jerry Brown called me and asked me, if I would accept an appointment to the California Supreme Court. And I told him, thank you so much, I'm honored, but I like my work on the Ninth Circuit. He then talked to me for three hours, but I kept saying, no, no, thank you, no, no. So I stayed on the Ninth Circuit. So Sam and I were the only people in recent history that turned down an appointment to the Supreme Court of California. Interesting, interesting. Um, how, did, how did sitting on the Ninth Circuit differ from sitting on the California Court of Appeals? It differed totally. On the California Court of Appeals, uh, we had about the same number of cases per month for the oral argument. But what the California Court of Appeal did is the presiding judge would cut up the calendar, approximately 30 cases, into, into thirds, and give each judge who was going to be on the calendar a month later, the, the task of writing a proposed opinion. So I would take my 10 cases and write a proposed opinion. Two weeks before oral argument, we'd circulate it. The other two judges would make comments and say, well, I'm not persuaded by section two. Would you take a look at it? What about this? So we'd get it back and we'd, uh, we'd rewrite it. The day before argument, we'd meet on the, on the California Court of Appeal, and the judge who had the, had the writing assignment 
would speak first and defend his position. And then the other two judges would chime in and give their views. And by the end of the day, and sometimes it took all day, uh, we would have a tentative view with at least two judges as to what we should do. And the next day then, we'd appear for oral argument. Now all the lawyers who are, are in that part of, of the California Court of Appeal know that that's the way they work. So as I've told young lawyers, never waive argument for the California Court of Appeal because they have a tentative view. And your only chance to change somebody's view is going to be to stand up and argue. And I told him about an experience I had where during our discussion the previous day, one of the judges said, oh, I'm not persuaded by that. I have real problems with that. So the next day, the lawyer for the defendant stood up and argued. And when he finished, um, he said, do your honors have any questions? And my colleague to my right didn't say anything. So I said, well, counsel, let me ask you this question. And when I finished, he glared at me and stumbled through an argument to, to the question. It wasn't my question, it was my colleague's question who had not addressed it to this lawyer. So the lawyer had the chance to try to answer. I still didn't change my view, but at least he got to be heard. Now, on the Ninth Circuit, we do not discuss any case before argument. And what happens is we also split the cases up into thirds but we give them to law clerks to write a memorandum to assist us in preparing for oral argument. We do our own preparation. I read the briefs. I check the cases. I don't tell my law clerks how I feel. I say, you write an independent bench memo. And then a week before argument, we circulate it. Uh, we then go to argument. And I listen to counsel. At the end of each day at noon, we Take, we go into chambers and the three of us give our views as to what we've heard. And that's the first time we have had any communication about the case. So that's a total different approach. Completely different. It's completely yeah. different. That's very interesting. I'm glad you made that distinction. Um, do you have a, a personal theory on writing opinions? When you're assigned an opinion, do you have, um, how do you approach it? When, you, when you're assigned well, an opinion? What I do in approaching, when, when I'm assigned the 10 cases, when I sit on, on a panel, I uh, wait till my law clerks have finished their work before I talk to them, so I get their independent view. Because I may read a set of briefs and say, oh, there's a case from the Supreme Court, I remember, that squarely sat satisfies this. I may have missed a more recent case in the Supreme Court. My law clerks are trained to give me the cases up to last night from the Supreme Court. So I wait until I see what they've done. I check my notes. I check the cases they have decided. In the 10 cases that I have been assigned, about four or five of them look to me like I've got the right view and that I'll at least get one vote. So I will write a proposed opinion, but I won't circulate it. I will wait till I hear from the lawyers, see if they change my mind. I will wait till I hear from my colleagues. As the other four or five cases, there will be questions that I'm not sure about. And so I don't even start trying to write the final opinion until I've heard argument and heard from my colleagues. So that's the approach I use. Interesting, very interesting. I want to change, change, um, uh, horses here a little bit um, and go back to um, your experience as uh, uh, clemency secretary to Governor Brown. Um, you mentioned that you had told Governor Brown when he was considering your appointment to that position that, that uh, you supported the death penalty and that uh, the governor was obviously opposed to the death penalty. But you've developed quite a reputation for having um, studied the whole issue of capital punishment yes. and, and have some, um, some particular views. Would you like to share some of your, your opinion about that? Well, I, I spent approximately two years advising him as to whether he should intervene or not, whether to grant clemency or not. 
And in a handful of cases, I recommend that he, not, that he intervene and that they reduce the punishment. And uh, in each of the cases that I made that recommendation, he followed my advice. And in fact, in one of the cases, um, the man had killed his wife, who he was totally intoxicated. He believed she was having an affair. They were separated. So he uh, was lying in wait in the next to the barn. And when she drove up in her car after, being, after playing bridge with uh, her friends, he fired into the front of the car and he killed his wife. She was not having an affair. She was not with anybody. Uh, the jury in that small county came back quickly with a first degree murder death penalty. Now one of the problems in that tiny county is that one of his brothers was in prison for first degree murder. A sister-in-law had killed her husband. She was in prison for first degree murder. So this family had a terrible reputation. So the governor, I looked at that case and I said to the governor, uh, Governor, you've already uh, decided not to intervene under Cecil Poole, my predecessor. He said, I want your opinion. I said, well, you've already indicated to the press that you shouldn't intervene. He said, I want your opinion. So I looked at the medical files and I found out that three days before this event, he had been in a bar fight and he was hit on the head with a baseball bat. And he was unconscious for many, many hours. From my experience in the DA's office as a prosecutor, I knew about uh, the problems of a concussion of the frontal part of the brain, which affects your ability to control your affect, your ability to control your emotions. So I went into the governor and I said, Governor, would you permit me to have this man examined by the best people in San Francisco to study his brain to see if he has any concussion to his brain from this baseball bat. And they came back and they said, absolutely. His frontal lobe is in terrible shape and that would control his ability to control his emotions. So I came into him and I said, I think you should reduce this to life imprisonment. The jury had not been told by the defense lawyer of anything about the man's prior. He just hadn't looked at his medical record and apparently never asked his client that. So the next a few days later, the governor, Pat Brown, had a hearing and he used to conduct his own clemency hearings. And I was seated there <laughs> and he uh, said to the DA from the county where this man came from, he said, my clemency secretary, who was a mean, tough, former prosecutor from Los Angeles thinks I should intervene in the case because the man had great damage to his frontal lobe and apparently that wasn't brought out at the trial. And the prosecutor said, Your Honor, Your Governor, if I had known that, I would not have asked for the death penalty. So that was the most fascinating experience I had as a clemency secretary of the governor. Now you asked me about the opinions I formed. I left the governor's office still not opposed to capital punishment, and I put it that way. I'm not saying I'm in favor, but I'm not opposed for this reason. I am concerned about the other inmates and about the guards. If people who are monsters, who have killed somebody under terrible conditions, what they will do to other people. And until we can solve that, I don't feel comfortable with saying we should abolish the death penalty. I don't know if, if you've come across it, but I wrote a couple of articles recently in which I examined the judicial procedures in both in California and in the federal system. And the system is broken. We have many people on death row have been there well over 20 years. The last, two edit, the last two executions were of people who had been there over 30 years. There's only 13 people have been executed since 1978. 
in this state and the taxpayers in this state, including me, has spent four billion dollars trying to enforce the death penalty through our present laws. Um, we recommended that the laws be changed, that the system get rid of the bottlenecks in the system. By the way, the legislature has done nothing to follow our recommendation. Why is that not surprising? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've covered a lot of ground here and a lot of time of your, uh, in your career. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you want to tell us? Well, you haven't asked me about the most interesting case I had on the Ninth Circuit. And that's what, if I could spend a couple of minutes Please do. About that. I'd love to hear. I, had a, I was on a panel with two wonderful judges, including, by the way, Judge Harry Ferguson. And the issue in the case was whether the uh, department, the uh, federal department that controls trains and ra the railroads, whether a regulation they issued that the, that the uh, railroad companies could give surprise tests to people who operated trains in this country to see if they were intoxicated or has used or had used drugs. The two is, it, is this the Skinner, judges is this the Skinner who, case? Pardon me? Is this the Skinner case? The which case? Skinner? Yes. It is the Skinner case. So the district court judge um, said that the regulation was constitutional. My two colleagues disagreed with the district court judge, and uh, I dissented in that case. And I wrote a dissenting opinion indicating that the Supreme Court said that the public interest can trump the rights under the Fourth Amendment. And I said, here these trains are going across the country at 90 miles an hour, and uh, if the people on the train are drunk or are under the influence of drugs, they, they pose an incredible danger. And I said, a railroad train, the engine of a railroad train in a roundhouse can't hurt anybody. But on the highways at midnight, it can kill. Well, my two colleagues disagreed. The full court agreed with my two colleagues of the full court of the Ninth Circuit. The Supreme Court granted certiorari. They, grant, they granted the right to review the case. And they came down with a decision. Now, they, the day that they came down with the decision, my wife had said, please be home at five o'clock. I'm entertaining 12 people. There's a lot of help I will need. Be home at five o'clock. And I said, of course I'll be home at five o'clock. Well, at 4.30, I got word that the Supreme Court not only had issued a decision in that case, in the Skinner case, but it also adopted my dissent and my views. So I sat there reading the case and reading the case until 5.30. And I got home at 6.15 and I burst into the kitchen and I said, you won't believe this, darling. But the Supreme Court has ruled seven to two in favor and adopted my dissent. And not only that, but they quoted paragraphs crediting me with writing that. And she said, you are late. Clean out the cat box and take out the trash. <laughs> <laughs> that brought me back to earth. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. That, I just love that story. That's marvelous. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. That's a good one. And that's probably a good place for us to end today. Okay. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down with us and, it's been fun. and chat. Thank you so much. You're welcome.